So we're going to do this um, postal discussion a little bit differently than uh, some of the ones that happened earlier today. I have a bunch of questions that I'd like to ask them, and then if we have time, we'll open it up for the audience. Um, because I, I have my watch, so I know what time they want to start the reception. So I, I need to time this. Um, John Osaki, you hardly, you hardly need an introduction. Head of JCYC, filmmaker of other films that, that we've watched. Um, let me just go down and introduce everybody really quickly. Lauren Kawana, you were, you, oh, I guess I should have said in the proper order. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Kawana, on, the, on, the far, uh, on your far right, um, consulting producer, although John told me when we had a side discussion that, oh my God, Lauren did practically so, mu so many things and was such a great researcher. Um, Joseph Savoy, you, ha you not only work for John now, but um, we understand that this film and, and your history has inspired you to become a professor of Asian American studies. Oh, not a professor yet. No, no, no. <laughs> inspired you to want to become, is that correct? Yes. All right. <laughs> and John Tawaki needs no further uh, introduction. You guys have seen the, the work that John has done for the community. Yeah. Yes. So, John, one of the questions that I think all of us want to know is what inspired you to make this film? Well, so it started when um, I was finishing up um, a, a documentary short I was working on about my kids uh, pilgrimage to Tule Lake. And when I was finishing up that project, I thought that it would be a good idea to brush up on my incarceration history. So um, I, I started doing some research and I stumbled across the report Personal Justice Denied, which was the report that ICO helped the research for by the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And when I started reading this report, um, I, you know, I was shocked at how much I didn't know. And this was all happening around the same time that we, <laughs> we had our last presidential election. Um, so certainly, um, you know, some of the rhetoric um, that was taking place ac across this country, the ignorance that was growing about the story of this community and what happened during World War II, um, just, I mean, it really um, threw me for a loop. I mean, I, I, I guess I should have expected it, but it was, it was shocking to me to hear educated public officials be so ignorant about what happened to our community. And so it was really at that point that I decided that, um, and then of course, uh, also around the you know in the same year I also learned ICO story and you know I people know a lot of people know here I've been working in this community for over 30 years and so the fact that I didn't know about it I was positive that the young people I work with didn't know about it and so I just want to make sure that um, this story was told and told in a way where people could really understand it there's a lot of you know, legalese and legal documents and things involved in this. And so I wanted to try to present it in a way where it was accessible to everybody. So Lauren, you're a filmmaker in your own right. You worked on a documentary about Patsy Ming. Um, why did you say yes to working on this film? Because I begged her. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't quite like that. Um, I am very thankful to Kenji, actually, for introducing me to John, um, he said, "Hey, there's this, um, you know, filmmaker who wants to get a documentary off the ground." And um, I attended the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism uh, uh, for my master's, and uh, they have a specific documentary film program there. And I um, had known Kenji uh, <laughs> through another friend, and he said you know, he's looking for some help, and would you like to help him? And, and when I spoke with John, um, he was just so passionate, and I have been consistently inspired by how much he cares about this community. And I, I said yes, because I, I'm a fourth generation Japanese American. Uh, my father is Japanese, and um, I, grew, I was born and raised in Hawaii. And I, you know, there's a lot I don't know personally about, you know, the experiences of 
Japanese uh, Americans on the West Coast. And since moving here six years ago, I've really tried to learn a lot about that experience. And, um, you know, just hearing the things that he was telling me that he learned, you know, as someone who is, imbe is embedded in this community really inspired me. And um, I'm just, I'm just blown away by what he was able to do. Yeah. Joe says your turn now. Now, have you have you been on screen a lot before? Is this your maid voice? It's the first time. Oh, <laughs> nice job. What what made you decide to say yes? Well, first of all, John's my boss, so I can't really <laughs> say no to that. <coughs> when he was starting this film, um, I was going into my senior year at Tufts University, um, where I studied American studies. Uh, specifically Asian American studies. So it was kind of a moment where I was first diving into my own family's history, you know, going into the archives at UC Berkeley, the Bancroft Library, um, going online and just trying to find what there was. Um, so I thought this was actually a perfect moment to really investigate and research my own family's history, and I'm really thankful that John allowed me to speak. Um, my grandfather, who I uh, brought pictures of um, and was shown in the film, he was second generation Japanese American. He received education in Japan. Um, he was actually a no-no boy, a renunciant, um, and was deported um, at the end of the war. Um, and he actually passed away when my dad was a teenager, so I did not know him at all. So part of this journey was also me trying to navigate what this history was like you know, for our generations today. So again, I'm really thankful, John, for including me. So Don, I understand that as, as, aside from your on-screen role, you had a pretty heavy guiding hand behind the scenes. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, you know our history, especially the legal side, better than anybody, except maybe Dale Minami. Um, but, um, you know, John told me that you really led him to a lot of things. Um, you helped him find archival material or suggested that he look in certain places. Can you tell us a little bit about that behind the scenes story there? Well, I'm, first of all, I have to apologize to John because I gotta tell you, he sent me a link to this film. I just didn't have the time to view it. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I've seen it. <laughs> and what an amazing uh, gift to the Japanese American community, but more than that, um, it tells a larger story about the failure of our democratic institutions. You know, when the Justice Department does not tell the truth, when they intentionally suppress evidence in order to manipulate outcomes of critical landmark cases, what country do you live in? And that's really the story that, that <coughs> John ha has brought to the fore. I'm a little bit embarrassed he gave me so much face time. <laughs> I'm honored to be I'm honored to be part of it. So, when John was interested in this, um, uh, and I totally agree with you. There's, of course, Japanese Americans know they they were imprisoned, but they don't know how badly they got screwed. And <clears throat> the American public and historians and educated people now regard, most people regard the Japanese American incarceration as cha a shameful chapter of American history. But they don't know that, you know, what began at the lowest levels, I guess, of racial hysteria, culminated at the highest uh, levels of government as an intentional plan in order to manipulate the outcome of cases by lying. And so, uh, that's a story that is so important that when John was expressed his interest in this, of course, uh, he's a great he's a great storyteller, and when 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 he said he wanted to make it accessible, uh, I was really eager to point him to key documents. And the great thing about this case, between what Peter found and and Iko found, were literally this memorandum going back and forth between Justice Department lawyers, there's a big debate going on. And one side is saying, uh, we have to tell the truth. We have a duty to tell the truth. It's a crime to lie to the court. And the other side is, is basically ignoring them and saying, uh, we're gonna cover this thing up. And so of course, uh, when John was interested in focusing just on that 
point within the full broader context of what happened to japanese americans i was really anxious to start feeding him key documents and pointing out key language and things like that but the way you integrated a very complicated story into something that is really compelling that people can understand was 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 just a genius so thank you don had a lot of blind faith in me throughout this process he probably had more faith than he should have um but he you know he was he put me in touch with peter irons and then dale put me in touch with neil cotyle so i mean they you know they were just so instrumental in being able to to bring this story forward well i don't know that i would call it blind faith but you certainly restored the faith that they did place in you um so john what do you want the takeaway message to be well, I, I think um, what I, the message that I want taken away from all of this is that this community has such an important role to play in the future of our democracy. And that, you know, my father passed away in 2015 and all of his siblings are gone. Uh, my mother, who is here, I think she's still here, um, she's one of five siblings, and she's the only one left. And we are rapidly approaching a day where there will be no more living incarcerees. Uh, and we have to find a way to make sure that this story is not just remembered for the deprivation of civil liberties, but the you know how um, badly it infringed on our entire democracy. And I think that we have such an important role to play in that, and that as, um, as years go by, the ignorance about this story is only gonna grow. And we've or we now know that it's not a question of if, but when again will public officials or pol you know, and politicians manipulate this story, our story, to oppress other groups of people? And we have a huge role to play in making sure that that doesn't happen. And that the, the truth and the facts about what really happened to our community are understood more broadly. Because you know, one of the things that shocked me in the last pres presidential election was just how ignorant this country is getting, of course, about this story, but in general. I mean, really, I mean, it's, it's, it's really scary and I think this community has a huge role to play in making sure that our country stays educated and stays and stands fast to our democratic principles. Well said. So Joseph, I know that I didn't ask you this question ahead of time when you sort of wanted the list. You're you're younger than most of us here. What recommendations do you have? for those of us who want to keep on telling the story to keep it alive, how do we get your generation to listen and become engaged? It's a lot of pressure. No. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we just have to listen. I think there's so many folks in the room who tell these stories, and we have to listen. Um, I think oral history is a huge thing that gets overlooked, especially in academia. Um, as John's saying, you know, we're going to see a day where we're not going to have any living members of those who are incarcerated, and even those who fought for um, redress and reparations later on. Um, I think it's super important to carve out time within, you know, your higher education, even high school and college, to just track down your family records. Um, as a person of color, I think we all share similar narratives, similar histories in this country. Um, there are documents out there. Um, I uh, personally uh, wrote my thesis on my grandfather's incarceration story, so that was a tremendous story to share with my parents and bring back home. Um, now, when I uh, work at JCYC, I'm trying to tell the story to you know Japanese Americans my own age. You saw the last clip on there. That was actually the Nikkei Community Internship Program that I helped coordinate um, over the summer. Um, so it was an amazing opportunity to just sit down um, with folks my own age to think about what the incarceration means to us today, um, because I don't think we get enough opportunities to share that story. 
Well, the wonderful thing about J.C. Weiss is how multicultural it's become, too. So it does give you another avenue to educate people who may not necessarily um, have any Jan Japanese ancestry in other parts. Yeah. Um, so, Lauren, you did all this research and everything. What surprised you the most as, as you were researching and, and contributing to the film? Um, that's a great question. And I just, you know, I really... John did so much of this, <laughs> um, uh, but I do. I did spend a day at the Hoover Archives where um, the Carl Bendetson papers are uh, stored, um, and <laughs> <laughs> and it, it it was actually a very creepy experience for me. Um, I I mean I I was really shuffling through boxes and boxes of his papers and you know some of the photos that we found in that film and. And the uh, end tagline uh, about him and what happened to him uh, showed the this cutout article uh, that I had found of him being awarded a Distinguished Service Medal for um, the way he handled the incarceration, which just chilled me to the bone um, that we could be, uh, you know, celebrating him. And um, I, you know, throughout the photos and other things, you know, he went on to the private sector and was an executive. Um, uh, the company is escaping me right now, but I mean, he went on to live, you know, a very um, affluent, uh, comfortable life. And, you know, these people who were behind the scenes really, uh, especially him, uh, as you could see uh, at the end, uh, never really, uh, apologized or acknowledged that what they did was wrong. Um, and so that, to me, shows the importance of you really need to hold, uh, we do have a responsibility to hold people accountable and, and the fact that Aiko, you know, her, la her last line that John put in that I loved is just, if you see something wrong, say something. And I think that's something that is hard for many of us, especially in the Japanese American community, but it is something that I try to think about a lot more uh, uh, as I you know, continue on in my life. I love the title, Alternative Facts. It's one that we hear bandied about a little too often nowadays. <laughs> Closing question for both Dawn and John. So what's the call to action, Dawn? Well, <coughs> let me make a personal plea to every person in this room. Because we've gone through this, you can speak with a moral authority about what's going on today that other people cannot. I mean, for example, the parallels between what happened to Japanese Americans and what is taking place now, for example, the travel ban, are disturbing. You know, both, of, both situations arose out of war, right? Both um, involved the government invoking uh, national security or military necessity as a means of shielding its decisions from judicial scrutiny. The court just didn't ask any questions, stood down. Both involved high officials uh, with overtly, blatantly racist, um, bigoted attacks against a targeted minority. And both involved uh, the courts reviewing it, but then ultimately deferring to the president and not being willing to be a check and balance um, uh, on the unbridled exercise of executive power. Oh, and both involve hidden uh, government reports uh, claiming to justify uh, these decisions, these actions against a targeted minority, um, and w w while at the same time refusing to disclose these reports uh, to the American public and, and to the people. So, you know, we have what John's film reveals is the Japanese American incarceration was based upon a claimed military necessity. Well, that was phony, never existed, it was manufactured, it was made up. The travel ban, in which um, uh, American families are still separated by that, people were literally caught in the air when that order, you know, was issued. Um, and, and there was a Homeland Security report claimed to be the basis justifying it, which the government refu re refused to disclose. And then ultimately the court not only did not compel disclosure, 
but then defer to president trump so it's probably a made up national security you know a claim and then finally you have a national emergency being declared to build a wall that congress has expressly uh rejected appropriation for uh and we know that is a phony uh reason so military necessity for japanese americans national security on the travel ban and now national emergency for the wall all based upon uh the naked assertion of a president who apparently you know neither the congress nor the courts have been willing to check so of course we're here to talk to remember about what happened to japanese americans but that's not really the point i think the point is what's happening now and you can you can we can take our own experience in our own history and the targeting of immigrants today and it goes beyond even national security military necessity there are attacks now on birthright citizenship there are attacks on family reunification most asian americans in the united states are really the beneficiaries of of uh, family re reunification policies that started in the mid 60s and so what's that called now chain migration and birthright citizenship anchor babies and refugee visas uh, have been literally slashed in half and you know the vietnamese community the cambodian american community the Hmong american community as far as asian americans are concerned without refugee visas they would not be here so <clears throat> what i'm saying is that what's happening today really touches it directly touches our community uh, but it's also for most of us really we're maybe one or two degrees of separation from the folks that are being targeted now so the the message is very personal and i think uh i think the movie is very helpful in in uh, bringing it home how personal it is so i think uh, for all of us that i would say when we leave the room is to figure out what we can do john last thoughts what what do you want the call to action to be you riled us up you've inspired I hope us so. i hope so i hope i riled people up i i love riling people up <laughs> you know i think i often wonder what would have happened if people if groups of people had stood up for this community in 1942 because nobody did with the exception with some very very minor exceptions nobody stood up for this community i mean the aclu did not support this community it required lawyers to defy them to defy the national board for those litigants to get representation so nobody stood up for this community and i often wondered how might things have been different maybe they wouldn't have been but maybe they would have and i think that knowing our experience because i mean let's face it folks the japanese american community has a history that this country wants to forget it's not taught in our schools these stories weren't passed weren't talked about openly within our families and as time goes by the ignorance is just going to grow and so we have to find a way to make sure that this story stays relevant to what's going on in our society and i think we have to figure out a way on how we are going to use this experience to support other groups of people right now because it's interesting so that the last scene and one of the last scenes of the college students having conversation they said something really interesting they said um, they talked about how in this country we have good immigrants and good minorities and we have bad ones and once upon a time we were the bad ones we were the ones that this country didn't want and nobody supported us they were fine with laws being made to keep us out to ban i mean i it just blows my mind as i was researching through this that this country once made me illegal to immigrate into this country i mean think about that and so i think we have to think about our experience what happened to to our community and how we are going to make sure that we use those experience to stand up for other communities 
because they are many of them are in similar positions where you know fortunately there are more people coming forward today than what happened in one nine hundred forty two but we have as don said we have so much leverage we have been a store a story that's so important to this country that i think we can really make a difference for other people other groups in this country and i very much hope that we do so john don joseph and lauren thank you so much for joining us today thank you over to Kenji. I'd like to do one small commercial plug if I may. Um, as many of you know, I've been working on a film about Norman Mineta for many, many years, and I'm pleased to announce that next week there will be an initial announcement. PBS National has decided to air the Norman Mineta film documentary. It will be on Monday, May 20th at 9 p.m. in prime time. So we're really happy about that. So that's our way of also educating the country about this, what, ha what has happened to Norm and, um, and his generation, and also the parallels that are going on even today. So thank you very much, Kenji. It's my pleasure to bring you back up here. You're <coughs> not, who is? What are, what are uh, John's plans for distribution? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm glad you, a uh, you asked that. So um, I love, I'm very happy to show this film to this community. Uh, but what I'm really interested in doing is taking it to other parts of the country who know nothing about what happened to this community. I want to take it to the South. I want to take it to the Midwest. I want it... I want to bring it to college campuses where there are young voters, <coughs> where we can have dialogue about this because they aren't being taught any of this in their schools. So that's, that's what my hope is, is I want to bring this to as many communities as I can and have dialogue with people and maybe, just maybe, change a few hearts and minds along the way. 